Uh, good afternoon. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians on the land on which we're having our meeting, um, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to their elders past and present. It's uh, really great to be able to introduce Philip to give his completion seminar. Um, Philip uh, faced some pretty big uh, challenges when he started in our lab, the biggest of which was for him a self-declared socialist and vegetarian to be amongst a group of uh, uh, meat-loving uh, people. <laughs> and this was at the time uh, when, when Trump was elected and was systematically destroying all his ideological values. <laughs> but I think this gave Philip the courage and the resilience to tackle a pretty big program of PhD research, which was to find and identify some new treatments for HIV using a very complex and tedious human immune system mouse that he'll describe. And he was um, I'm able to generate some really amazing data which um, scored him an invitation to the biggest HIV meeting in the world, which is the International AIDS um, Conference at the time in Paris just um, over a year ago. And um, I think uh, that it was a, a tremendous piece of work that he was able to, uh, to generate. Um, and at, at that meeting, there's a lot of very, very big egos and uh, also a lot of opinions based on not a lot. And this is really the antithesis of, uh, of Philip, who is an incredibly humble scientist who will pour over data for hours and hours before he even makes a tentative conclusion. <laughs> So I, I think Philip's achieved an, a, tr a tremendous amount of really good work, and I think you should be incredibly proud of, of what you've achieved, especially given the circumstances of being in a hostile, um, omnivorous environment. <laughs> and for your sake, I hope uh, Bernie Sanders wins the next election. Um. Thank you, Greeny. Straight to the gulag for you. <laughs> so today I'm going to discuss investigating clinical therapeutics to kill latently infected cells and promote HIV clearance. And this fits within the broader context of our lab's work, which aims to target the host and the host immune system in efforts to cure chronic persistent viral infections. And this is in contrast to more traditional efforts, efforts which uh, uh, attempt to target the microbe directly. So human immunodeficiency virus and its related syndrome, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, has affected more than 75 million people worldwide. And an estimated 37 to 40 million people are now living with this virus, a burden which overwhelmingly affects the African continent. HIV infection is still to this day one of the major causes of morbidity and mortality worldwide. And its eradication is listed as a key World Health Organization Sustainable Development Goal leading into the year 2030. HIV is a human retrovirus which infects activated CD4 T cells when elements of the HIV envelope complex bind the CD4 T cell receptor as well as one of two potential co-receptors. This leads to virion fusion with the host cell and capsid entry. After being injected into the host cell, HIV RNA is reverse transcribed into DNA and integrated into the host genome. After integration, HIV uses the host cell as a factory to create more viral particles. And at the end of the viral life cycle, the host cell is killed by HIV-related cytotoxic effects. So just to reiterate this point, the majority of CD4 T cells are killed during active HIV infection. Now here we have a time course which depicts both the levels of HIV RNA in the blood, a reflection of viremia, and this is in the red line here, as well as the CD4 T cell count in blue during the course of HIV infection. Now during normal infection, HIV levels in the blood 
reach a peak within a few weeks, known as the acute phase. But this is followed by an adaptive immune response, which leads to partial control. You eventually get a steady state level of viremia, known as viral set point. So the body can't quite clear the virus, but at the same time, there are some breaks on viral replication. And this leads to the chronic say, stage of infection. Meanwhile, from the outset of infection, HIV begins to kill CD4 positive T cells via these viral cytopathic effects. And eventually, over many years, this leads to severe immunodeficiency, chronic inflammation, and progression to AIDS, whereby patients are susceptible to a range of infectious and oncological complications. So, the major development in HIV eradication over the past 30 years has been combination antiretroviral therapy, or ART. ART encompasses a range of different drug classes which each target different elements of the viral life cycle, including binding, reverse transcription of RNA to DNA, integration into the host, and lastly, uh, viral maturation and budding. So antiretroviral therapy effectively prevents the spread of infection and durably suppresses viremia, which you can see by this precipitous drop in the red line here. On top of this, ART allows CD4 T cell recovery and stops and reverses disease progression, improving health and normalizing life expectancy. And so the widespread rollout and administration of antiviral therapy since the turn of the 21st century has resulted in major reductions in the number of deaths and new infections from HIV across the globe. Although interestingly, this hasn't quite happened at the desired pace so as to reach the World Health Organization development goal milestones, shown here in the red dot. Now, despite the success of antiretroviral therapy, art does not cure HIV infection. When therapy is stopped, blood HIV levels rebound, and CD4 T cells begin to die off again, leading to disease progression if therapy is not recommenced. This phenomenon is known as viral rebound. And the source of viral rebound and disease progression is a dormant latent viral reservoir, which we now know is established at the early stages of infection and persists. So what is this viral reservoir? How do we define it? As I mentioned earlier, the majority of CD4 T cells are killed during active infection. However, there is an incredibly small minority of infection events where the conditions are just right that the cell will, that the virus will sync with the host cell and the host cell will survive the infection process. And the HIV DNA will integrate into the host genome and it'll go to sleep there. So the past few decades of research have highlighted resting memory CD4 T cells as the core reservoir population. And we know that it's only about one in a million resting CD4 T cells which will actually harbor replication competent HIV DNA. Furthermore, it's important to note that there are no recognized surface markers of latency. So out of the million or so resting, CD4, uh, resting memory CD4 T cells that we might be looking at at any given time, we have no way of knowing which one of these is actually harboring latent HIV DNA. And so one reason for this is that the transcriptional machinery that drives HIV replication is inactive in these cells. And rebound represents the latent cell waking up from its dormant state uh, when antiviral therapy is stopped. And now because these latent cells are not replicating and producing virus, antiretroviral therapy has no effect on them. So on top of all this, the viral reservoir has an incredibly long half-life and it can also be found in different compartments in the body from the peripheral lymph nodes to the blood to even the gut associated lymphoid tissue. And what this amounts to is the necessity of a lifelong antiretroviral regimen characterized by essentially a pill a day which is required to keep the virus at bay. So when I use the term viral rebound, 
What I'm talking about are the clinical manifestations of the viral reservoir waking up and restarting viral replication. So viral rebound is a direct measurement of the existence of the viral reservoir. And the longer it takes a patient to rebound, the smaller the viral reservoir is. So when we discuss a cure for HIV, what we're referring to is the elimination of the latent viral reservoir and the ability of a patient to completely stop taking antiretroviral drugs without the risk of viral rebound. So is there any precedent to believe that a cure is possible? Is there anything which can indicate a way forward for how we might target this incredibly rare population of cells? The answer to this is yes. There exists a cure case which gives hope that a complete cure without lifelong antiviral therapy is possible. And this cure case is popularly referred to as the Berlin patient. Now, the Berlin patient was an HIV-infected individual on suppressive antiretroviral therapy in the early 2000s. And in 2008, they underwent a hematopoietic stem cell transplant for acute myeloid leukemia. And these cells came from a donor which had a mutation in one of the HIV co-receptors. Now, an aggressive conditioning regimen, as well as elements of graft versus host disease, resulted in near complete replacement of recipient immune cells with donor cells. So this, together with the resistance of donor cells to HIV infection, resulted in complete prevention of viral rebound following uh, antiretroviral discontinuation. And so this person has now had no detectable viremia off art for more than 10 years. And so this is really a staggering case and something like this is you know, the holy grail of HIV cure research. But what's really important for us to take away from this is that this person is the only known case of an HIV cure. And this was achieved in part by eliminating the hematopoietic compartment, which suggests that the hematopoietic reservoir represents the main body of latently infected cells. Now, although this is an N of one, it gives us a clue as to where our eradication efforts should be targeted. To date, the most widely pursued approach to purging the latent viral reservoir has been known as kick and kill. Now, the kick and kill approach uses a class of drugs known as latency reversing agents. So latency reversing agents seek to target and activate the host cell transcriptional machinery. Machinery which is typically hijacked by HIV itself in order to replicate. The idea was that by restarting host cell transcription, you could kickstart HIV DNA into making RNA and then more virus. The consequence of restarting active viral replication would be, it was hoped, that the once latent host cell would die via HIV-mediated cytopathic effects or immune clearance, just like we see happens in the earlier stages of infection before ART. Meanwhile, continuous rounds of antiretroviral therapy would prevent further infection of neighboring uninfected cells. And so it was hoped that this way you could get these cells to die. Now, while many studies have demonstrated that latency reversing agents can induce HIV production in vitro and even in vivo, today there's been no evidence that this reactivation process actually kills latently infected cells. Indeed, two clinical trials from 2014 and 15, as an example, used separate but both at the time promising latency reversing agent candidates, and they concluded that the treatments did not induce latent cell killing and so did not reduce the size of the reservoir in patients. So reactivating viral transcription does not kill the latent cell. Now, as many of you at WEHI may know, one of the best ways to kill cells is to target the pro-survival proteins, which make up the intrinsic apoptotic pathway. So the BCL2 family of proteins regulate cell death and survival in response to internal stress stimuli. The BCL2 pro-survival proteins antagonize back and backs and prevent them from initiating the caspase cascade. Cell death is induced when BH3-only proteins, so these are pro-death, 
when they block pro-survival members and induce back and backs to initiate this caspase cascade. So the BH3 only proteins drive cell death. On top of this, the BH3 only proteins differ in their affinity for different BCL2 pro-survival members across both time and space, as you can see here. So this characteristic of specificity for different pro-survival proteins has been exploited in the development of small molecule inhibitors known as BH3 mimetics, which, as the name suggests, mimic the action of BH3 only proteins and induce cell death by inhibiting BCL2 pro-survival family members. And so, for example, ABT737 inhibits these three pro-survival members. There's an MCL1 inhibitor and venetoclax uh, inhibits BCL2 specifically. And so this is important because we postulate that there are apoptotic blocks in place, such as a greater dependence on pro-survival proteins, which are preventing one in a million resting, CD4 memory, uh, resting memory CD4 T cells from dying during active HIV infection and going on then to form the latent viral reservoir. So consider an analogy with certain cancers. We have a population of cells which are resistant to cell death because of their addiction, if you will, to BCL2 pro-survival family members. And one way to kill these cells, as we've seen the past, three, past few years with venetoclax, is to exploit and inhibit these pro-survival proteins allowing you to preferentially kill cancer cells over normal cells. And so we hypothesize a similar scenario for the latent HIV reservoir, which is distinctly different from all other infected cells. And this has allowed it to persist in a way that's perhaps similar to cancer cells. And so this raises the question, can we preferentially target these cells by antagonizing the intrinsic apoptotic pathway with BH3 mimetics, thereby sensitizing latent cells to death and purging the viral reservoir. Now this question represents the overarching hypothesis of my PhD seminar today. So just to reiterate, we are hypothesizing that latently infected cells may be sensitized to cell death using pro-apoptotic therapeutics such as BH3 mimetics. And to answer this question, we have two key aims. The first is to use an in vitro T cell survival assay to assess the impact of BH3 mimetics on killing HIV infected cells. The second aim, and the aim which will really form the crux of my talk today, is to use a preclinical in vivo model of HIV latency to then probe whether these BH3 mimetics can actually purge the latent viral reservoir and kill infected cells, and then ask whether this can delay viral rebound, which, as I mentioned earlier, is really the core measure of the latent viral reservoir. So AIM-1 will represent a sort of screening process to determine which BH3 mimetics could be progressed into our preclinical model of HIV latency. So the activated T cell survival assay begins when we isolate and purify human CD4 T cells from an uninfected blood donor. We activate these cells uh, by mimicking TCR stimulation, and then this renders them receptive to infection with HIV carrying a GFP reporter. Once we achieve a proportion of cells that are infected, we can come in with our BH3 mimetics, and then we analyze for cell death and look to see whether we can preferentially kill HIV-infected cells over uninfected cells. And so this experiment will give us an indication of whether or not we can sensitize infected cells to death using BH3 mimetics. So we first looked into ABT737, which as you can see here, inhibits these three pro-survival proteins and was one of the first BH3 mimetics to be clinically tested. And so this gave us an encouraging initial signal that BH3 mimetics, that blocking BCL2 pro-survival proteins, 
could be used to preferentially kill HIV-infected cells. Now, ABT737 was never progressed clinically because of its dose-limiting thrombocytopenia. So the next option was venetoclax, which specifically targets BCL2. And what we saw was a similar dose-dependent killing of HIV-infected cells with venetoclax. So venetoclax represents an excellent clinical therapeutic to progress into our in vivo latency model because it has a strong translational potential due to its well-established safety and pharmacokinetic profile in humans. And so this result gave us a positive signal with which to move forward and look at the effect of venetoclax in our in vivo latency model. So the mouse model that we use is really a valuable asset in HIV cure research, and it will help us probe whether BH3 memetics can purge the reservoir and delay time to viral rebound. So our mouse model of HIV latency is characterized by human immune system mice, or humanized mice, which are created by injecting human hematopoietic stem cells into the facial vein of one-day-old Nodskid gamma pups. So these are mice which are severely immunocompromised and which have been irradiated on top of this to make room in the bone marrow for engraftment. And so about 16 weeks later, we find that when these mice have grown up, they recapitulate key aspects of the human immune phenotype, including human CD4 T cells at physiologically relevant levels. After we assess the reconstitution of our mice, they're ready to be infected with a wild-type strain of HIV. And so how does this play out compared to humans? When we consider the progression of infection in the blood of humans, as measured by the viral load in the red here, we see that a viral set point is established prior to antiretroviral therapy. Antiretroviral therapy successfully suppresses viremia to below detectable limits. And once antiretroviral therapy is stopped, the virus rebounds in the blood. Excuse me. And we know that this is due to the existence of a latent viral reservoir. Now, in our human immune system mice, what you can see is that it really well recapitulates what we see in humans. So we infect them with HIV, they establish a viral set point. We can then come in with a clinically relevant antiretroviral regimen. So we use the same drugs that they give patients in the clinic. And we can use this to fully suppress the viremia the viral load in these mice. Then, when we interrupt treatment, they rebound shortly after. And so you can see that this is a really cool and excellent model that mimics what we see in people. And so this, what this tells us is that we have also, in these mice, established a latent viral reservoir, which is the cause of this viral rebound. So, with this in mind, and with this, with this model at hand, we then wanted to treat these mice with venetoclax. So we infect them, we initiate antiretroviral therapy, and then we begin suppressing them. And when they're suppressed, after about seven to 10 weeks, we administered three cycles of venetoclax, with each cycle representing five daily doses via oral gavage, and then a two-day break, and then the next cycle, and the next. And so we started doing this three times. So before I assess the impact of venetoclax on the latent reservoir, I wanted to first sacrifice these mice directly after treatment and perform immunophenotyping to gain an insight into the killing capacity of venetoclax in this model. So we take these mice before stopping antiviral therapy and just after finishing venetoclax treatment. Now, although we didn't achieve statistical significance with the small numbers in this experiment, 
We observed a trend whereby venetoclax appears to be killing lymphocyte populations in the spleen and lymph nodes. And in particular, we see a signal in the central and effector memory CD4 populations, hinting that we might be impacting a population of cells which we know are enriched for the latent HIV reservoir. Another piece of information within this data is that we also appear to be impacting other cell populations, such as CD8, such as CD8s and B cells. Now, we know that in humans, venetoclax is very well tolerated, in fact, and does not, does not cause any profound immunodeficiencies. And so what we think may be happening here is that the inflammatory environment caused by HIV infection at the beginning and which persists during latency, this sort of inflammatory milieu could be sensitizing a broader population of cells towards death. Nevertheless, the important take home message is that we appear to be killing a population of cells that are enriched for the viral reservoir. So with this positive signal in mind, we wanted to directly measure our impact on the viral reservoir by performing a rebound experiment. Now, I wanna stress that virologic rebound following antiretroviral interruption is the key measure of reservoir size and proviral replicative capacity. And so what we did is after our three cycles of venetoclax, we stop antiretroviral therapy, we obviously stop venetoclax, and then we bleed these mice weekly and wait to see how long it takes for the virus to come back. So in black here, we have the vehicle or the untreated mice. And what we're looking at here is their viral load. So these mice establish a viral set point. We can come in with antiretroviral therapy and fully suppress their viral load. And then shortly after, they rebound. And this happens in this experiment. This happened between seven and 14 days following um, ART interruption. So what happens when we come in with three cycles of venetoclax? What we find is that the venetoclax treated mice in red here appear to rebound within the same time period as the vehicle treated controls. So there's one mouse that comes up a little bit earlier, but generally they appear to be coming up at around the same time. So an easier way to represent this sort of data is a Kaplan-Meier curve or a time to event plot in which an event is defined as a mouse rebounding virologically. And when we represent the data this way, what we see is that after three treatment cycles, venetoclax does not appear in this limited setting to delay viral rebound and therefore kill latently infected cells. So there are two possible interpretations of this result. The first and my least favorite is that venetoclax has no effect on killing latently infected cells. The second interpretation is that the tiny size of the viral reservoir and the rarity of these cells means that the shorter treatments do not kill enough latently infected cells for us in this relatively small setting to detect a rebound signal. And so our goal then was to magnify the effect size. So how can we do this? Well, the first option is to increase the number of animals per experiment. And while we're certainly in the process of repeating this experiment, it's possible that we would need a resource heavy number of mice to detect what could be a very small signal. The second way to magnify the effect size is to extend the duration of therapy. So here we hypothesized that the longer treatments will kill a greater proportion of latently infected cells within the reservoir pool. And therefore, this will reveal differences in rebound kinetics. And so this is what we sought to do next. So as you can see here, when we considered extended therapy duration, what we decided was to double the number of venetoclax cycles. So to go from three cycles to six cycles. And so once again, at the end of venetoclax therapy, I wanted to immunophenotype these mice to see what kind of effect we were having in our latent model. 
And what we saw was that once again, although we don't achieve statistical significance, there is a trend toward venetoclax killing key memory CD4 populations enriched for the proviral reservoir. And so again, this gave us a positive signal with which we could move forward in our rebound experiment to test whether or not we're actually preferentially killing latently infected cells. Now again, viral rebound following treatment interruption is the only reliable measure of reservoir size and proviral replicative capacity. So at the end of our sixth venetoclax cycle, we stop all treatment, we bleed these mice weekly, and we want to see how long it takes for them to come back virologically. Now, in the black, once again, you have the untreated mice. And you can see that they come back, as we expect, within four to seven days following treatment interruption. Now, when we treated mice with six cycles of venetoclax, what we found was that venetoclax-treated mice take longer to rebound than their untreated controls. And for the majority of mice, this takes place approximately one week later. But you can also very clearly see that some animals haven't rebounded until 28, 21 and 28 days post-therapy interruption. So once again, to get a better visualization of this data, we can represent it as a time to event. And when we do this, what we see is that venetoclax significantly delays viral rebound compared to untreated mice. And this delay extends to as much as four weeks post-therapy interruption, or 28 days. So this result is super exciting because it indicates that we're killing latently infected cells and purging the viral reservoir, a result which represents a key aim of HIV cure research. And so the idea that we're killing latently infected cells is really the only explanation for a delay in viral rebound, such as the one that we see here. Furthermore, this sort of result is precisely what current HIV cure research is about. Significant delays in viral rebound in a really good, robust in vivo model of HIV latency are incredibly informative and valuable. And delays of this magnitude in vivo are few and far between. On top of this, this is, to my knowledge, the first time that a pro-apoptotic compound, so one which in inhibits the um, propoptotic proteins with a known mode of action, in this case venetoclax, which targets BCL2, has been shown to kill latently infected cells and purge the viral reservoir in a preclinical setting. So the mouse model of latency and rebound that I've shown today is really an excellent tool for measuring the latent viral reservoir and assessing the impact of clinical therapeutics. And what we found was that venetoclax may indeed be killing latently infected cells. So on top of this, my data highlights a potential dependency on BCL2 survival protein for latent cell survival. But what really excites me about this are the potential clinical implications. So it's tantalizing to speculate that this could be progressed to a clinical setting because we've got evidence which suggests that it works in mice. And the next step, once we shore up these results, would really be monkeys or humans. Now, in monkeys, you have simian immunodeficiency virus, which is typically used. Obviously, this isn't HIV, so it's not ideal. But for, furthermore, we know that venetoclax is well, relatively well tolerated in people, and we already have an idea what its side effects would be and how to manage them and the starting doses involved. So it's really exciting to think that a clinical setting here is definitely within the realm of possibility. Now, to take you back to this image, what about other BCL2 family proteins? Perhaps a reason we didn't see a result after only three venetoclax cycles, and why it is that all our mice eventually rebound, is that there might be some heterogeneity within the viral reservoir pool, 
where some latent cells are reliant on different pro-survival proteins rather than BCL2. Now, as well as venetoclax, here at Weihai, I'm really lucky to have had access to another BH3 mimetic with a documented ability to kill cells. And that is the MCL1 inhibitor known as S63845, which I'm not going to refer to it as this, I'm going to call it MCL1 inhibitor. Um, and so we know that MCL1 is an important regulator of T cell development and survival. And we were interested to see whether MCL1 inhibition can also kill latently infected cells in our mouse model of HIV latency. So to do this, we virally suppressed our mice, and then we came in with six doses of the MCL1 inhibitor, which were administered twice weekly via intravenous injection. And then we stop all treatment once we're done with that and bleed these mice to detect rebound. So as with the previous results, the untreated mice in black here come up within about a week of stopping antiretroviral therapy. Now, the MCL1 treated mice also appear to rebound at about the same time as the untreated controls. But amongst this bundle of lines, it's difficult to get a bigger picture. So when we look at this as a Kaplan-Meier curve, indeed, MCL1 alone did not provide a strong positive signal in this experimental setting. However, two out of the eight animals treated with the inhibitor did not rebound until 14 days post-treatment interruption. And so this small signal potentially hints that there might be some latent cells which, instead of being reliant on BCL2 for survival, may be more susceptible to MCL1 inhibition and killing. And so this idea is important because it brings me to the sort of overarching conclusion of today's talk and the final message I want to leave you with regarding how the data I've presented today can inform our strategies with regards to targeting the latent viral reservoir. Now, I want to remind you of the results of the two in, of the short and the long in vivo venetoclax rebound experiments. Although we were limited in our mouse numbers, we found that a longer six cycle regimen preferentially killed latently infected cells and could amplify a rebound signal that was otherwise not observed in the shorter treatments. So to me, this raises a number of interesting ideas and clues as to how we can kill latently infected cells and delay viral rebound. Now the first insight is that treatment duration matters. If you want to kill enough latently infected cells so that you can detect significant rebound delays. So this supports this idea that these latently infected cells persist within the individual. And as they persist, over time, they're subject to different conditions which influence their susceptibility to BCL2 inhibition. So they cycle through the lymphatic and the blood systems where they might find privileged hiding spots, they're exposed to various cytokines or stress stimuli which affect BCL2 expression. And so one example could be antigenic tickling which kind of reactivates these cells and puts a bit of stress on them such that the apoptotic threshold is decreased and then venetoclax can come in and kill them. And this brings me to the second idea surrounding these results. It's possible that we couldn't kill enough latently infected cells with a shorter treatment because individual latent cells may be dependent on different pro-survival proteins. And the data with the MCL1 inhibitor, although it was a weak signal, could point us in this direction. And so another way to potentially amplify the rebound signal, even within a shorter treatment period, could be to combine different BH3 mimetics such as venetoclax and the MCL1 inhibitor, which could provide a double-pronged attack on the latent viral reservoir, killing more cells so that you can detect delays in viral rebound. And in fact, that's exactly what I'm in the process of doing now. So can we improve rebound delays by combining BH3 mimetics? 
This experiment, in fact, is nearing completion, relatively speaking. They, you can, so the plan is to perform a five consecutive doses of the MCL1 inhibitor, along with five consecutive doses of venetoclax, once these mice are suppressed. So the MCL1 inhibitor is administered intravenously, which does sort of um, prevent us from extending and put some limits on extending treatment duration between a certain points, because otherwise the tails of these mice become heinous. Um, and so despite this, though, it's still really exciting to pursue this experiment because we hope that we might still, with both of these drugs, be able to kill enough latently infected cells even for a short treatment. And so at the moment, I'm actually here, which... <laughs> So they're halfway basically being suppressed. They're probably almost done at the moment. Um, and then we're going to start treatment soon and then viral rebound. So really exciting and watch this space. Now, I want to leave you with sort of a broad picture with regards to what I envisage we could um, achieve in potentially human patients. So you have here a representation of all, you know, the, the hypothetical resting memory CD4 T cell pool and the latently infected cells within this pool. And so from what I've shown you today, there are some latently infected cells which are reliant on BCL2 for their survival. And when we come in with venetoclax, we can kill these latently infected cells preferentially. And perhaps we could come in with multiple treatment regimens to target more than one, or to target, well, obviously more than one, to target multiple. So on top of this, there could be some latently infected cells which are resistant to venetoclax killing due to their expression, or to, due to their dependence on MCL1 for survival. And so I envisage that perhaps you could have a combined approach, as I've outlined, where the MCL1 inhibitor will kill these latently infected cells. And so all the meanwhile, of course, the patient would remain on antiretroviral therapy to prevent further rounds of infection as you go about killing latently infected cells. One other important uh, potential factor is the use of latency reversing agents in conjunction with our killing agents. So if you recall back to the beginning of my talk, I mentioned that latency reversing agents can uh, instigate HIV transcription. And in doing this, it is possible that they put stress on the cell, obviously not enough to kill it, as I've shown. Um, and so perhaps then, once they put a bit more stress on the cell by inducing active replication, we can lower the apoptotic threshold that way and combine this with venetoclax to then come in and kill these cells. And so you can see that we've slowly started over time to deplete the HIV latent reservoir. Now, we could hypothetically continue with this until all of the latently infected cells, including this one, have been killed. However, and that is, would be considered a sterilizing cure where you wipe out all of the latent viral reservoir. However, another option, which is potentially more clinically realistic, would be to wipe out enough of the latent viral reservoir so that the human immune system can come in and enact a level of control over that that remains. So we're taking it out to below a certain, certain threshold such that there is no viral rebound. And so to take you back once again to this figure, my hope would be that we could take patients off antiretroviral therapy following this treatment period. And as a result, we could achieve a sustained, durable, disease-free progression and a lifelong cure. I want to end by acknowledging all the people who've made this work possible. So first and foremost is Mark, who is a remarkable scientist and a really, really awesome lab head to work with. He is incredibly supportive and understanding, and it's been a pleasure to be in your lab, Mark. Cody, who's been a co-supervisor, has 
<laughs> also been very supportive. <laughs> um, but on top of that, he's also, I like to think, been a really good friend. Um, he is an incredibly good scientist, but he also knows exactly what to say and he's a really great support. Anyway, <laughs> uh, Simon and James also have been incredibly good supports. I should mention that Cody, Simon, James and Merlin Bioservices actually performed the, um, at different stages, the intrafacial injections of the humanized mice. So this project wouldn't even be possible without their help. Uh, I want to thank the rest of the Pellegrini lab for padding out the lecture theater today. Um, and there's a lot of you, and you've all just been amazing to work with. The Infection and Immunity Division, fantastic group of people. Uh, Sarah, who was out. So all the HIV work takes place in this dungeon called the PC3. Um, and so it's a horrendous place to work. Uh, but people like Sarah, who was our past PC3 manager, make it that much brighter in there. And Cody's the PC3 manager now too, and so he's doing an okay job. So. Our former DivCo, Joan, Stella, our current DivCo for all the hard work she does. Bioservices, Merle, who injects these mice. So Cooney and Simon, that just hold the pup still while Merle does the hard part. Um, and so he's really been invaluable. Um, Carolina, who's involved, who was involved with another part of my project, which I didn't discuss today, but she was also great. I want to thank my PhD committee, Gabrielle and Peter, for their continuous support. Ajantha Rhodes in the Lewin and Cameron lab at the Peter Doherty Institute, she helped me develop, um, well, she helped me learn, not develop, an integrated HIV DNA PCR assay, which was formed a big part of um, some of this work. Uh, and then lastly, I want to thank my friends and family for the fantastic support and love that they've provided over these years. Um, and Bridget, my partner, who has... <laughs> Been just, she's amazing, she's so intelligent and brilliant and supportive, and it's great to have her. And the only reason that my title slides are centered is because of her. <laughs> Thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. Cells upregulate any pro survival protein? We don't. It's as in we can't. They're so rare and there's, we can't isolate them. We don't know what they look like. Um, you know, they're part of this memory core, right? So we assume that like other resting core memory T cells, in order to persist for the lifetime of the individual, maybe they do they do up upregulate certain pro survival proteins. But you know, to actually look at a lightning infected cell is Um, just wondering, you're about to do the combination treatment. Yes. Um, do you know, have you tested your humanized mice to see if they tolerate both drugs? Um, no. Not yet. <laughs> well, we're going to find out. <laughs> 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 yes. uh, Hi, um, there's evidence, I think, that HIV can be latent in the bone marrow, too. Yes. Have you looked at the bone marrow of your mice and whether your drugs have an effect on some Yes, I have. I didn't show that. Um, but the killing, as I showed, it, it's varied across cell types and all components, but we do see similar kind of amounts of killing in the bone marrow. Um, Great talk. Um, you said that you preferentially have killed like infected HIV cells, but you actually haven't shown that it is preferential, as in you've got cell death in these lately infected cells, which I know is really hard to yeah. show. Um, but do you think it's not a far stretch to actually say that you're getting death overall of every cell type, which you did show, therefore it's not preferential, it's just cell death? So, you know, so we do see, like, cell killing in other cell types, that's true. Um, kind of the, the short answer to that is we see cell killing at both a short treatment duration and a long term duration. So what that tells us is that we are sort of impacting the latent viral reservoir as we go, it's because we don't see rebound after three treatments, despite sort of equivalent amounts of killing there. And so, you know, the argument would be that because you don't see rebound after three weeks, despite that, you know, killing of other cells, then that we are impacting the latent viral reservoir after six weeks. 
actually following on from your first question, how do you think that the drugs are leading to the death specifically of latently infected cells? Do you think it's the decline of BCL2 or might it be spontaneous, spontaneously um, T cell reactivation of certain latently infected cells yeah. starting to express protein and that's why it's clear because you do get some non-specific decline mm. in your CD4 T cell mm. for overall. So, so, <laughs> good question. And so we, we know how the metaflax works, right? So we know that it directly inhibits B cell two. So we are kind of postulating that it must be killing cells that are reliant on B cell two for survival. And as I sort of alluded to in the talk, sure, B cells kind of over the course of their persistence in an individual might vary, even within a single cell, that B cell two dependency may vary over time, or we may see, there may be times where we can't target with metaflax. But that sort of ties into where we hope that you know, longer treatment durations or sort of intermittent treatment cycles can slowly begin to deplete these cells. Um, and we don't particularly envisage any major issues with immunodeficiency, because we know that in humans, the metaflax is pretty well tolerated. works, so can you please explain why it doesn't work on latently infected CD4? Yeah, so antiretroviral therapy, it only stops um, the spread of infection. So it doesn't actually um, kill the cells itself. It's HIV that's killing the majority of CD4 T cells. Mm -hmm. And so if a latent cell is not replicating, so there's no HIV that's being made, then antiretroviral therapy is useless. It will just kind of sit there and do nothing. But does it target the virus? The virus is dormant. It's completely transcriptionally silent. Yeah, but in cells that are infected with active HIV, yeah. how does the... So it targets the steps in the viral life cycle. So there are integrase inhibitors, for example, which will target the proteins that result in HIV integrase. DNA integration with the host genome. There are reverse transcriptase inhibitors which um, interfere with the ability of HIV to convert RNA to DNA. And so for it to be effective, HIV actually has to be going through all of these processes, which it's not in cells. So ART is membrane enabled? Yeah, it does. Um, and then the second question, if, how do you know ART doesn't affect Latently infected CD4 cells, if you can't isolate latently CD4 cells because you don't know what they look like. Well, we know it doesn't kill them because patients read them. Like, they're still there. So people can stay on antiretroviral therapy for decades, um, but then as soon as they stop, they rebound very logically. So we know that there is a pool of latently infected cells that in the, in the genome, genome of these cells they maintain a replication competent viral DNA. And so that's how we know that it doesn't work. Uh, yeah. um, so I'd like to ask a sort of technical slash ethical question. Sure. So in, in the experiments that you've presented so far, yeah. um, the N for your mouse groups has been quite small, and that's probably contributed to the fact that you've noticed trends rather than being able to yes. report hard and fast statistically uh, right. significant yes. uh, changes. So I wondered whether for this big experiment that's coming up, um, you are going to be able to get over that limitation and have a bigger number of animals in your groups. So, yeah, that's a perfectly valid point, and this is a matter of, as I mentioned, like, so I've kind of touched on this um, during my talk. Obviously, you can increase the power of these experiments by increasing the number of mice. And so this, in my work, is really impacted upon, not only by the fact that you're sending more mice to, you know, get any sort of power, but if the signal is quite small, which it is here because we're trying to find one in a million cells. So to do that, yes, you're right, we do need A, more mice, but as I've shown, you can also extend their duration, which will also sort of help amplify the magnitude of that signal. But I guess we're also limited in the fact that these mice, as 
they're a great model, but they take a long time to produce. So, you know, one figure here is the combination of six months of work. I totally appreciate that, but ultimately, <coughs> you want to publish your data. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so we've often got like multiple experiments overlapping and running um, in order to help compensate. As in, it is, as in, does it elicit an innate immune response or does it kill the innate immune response? As in, no, it only kills. No, no. <coughs> well, there is some suggestion that macrophages could form part of this latent reservoir, so they sometimes express a CD4 T cell receptor. Um, but that sort of the jury is still on out as to whether they represent the bona fide. Reac reactivation competent for all the cells. Okay, and when you're using genetoplasts or MCL1 inhibitors, mm. they will also be killing innate immune cells, like T cells? Um, so I believe in humans when they use genetoplasts, uh, there was some neutropenia, so killing the neutrophils, but this was I remember pretty easily managed with um, neutrophil growth factor, and so that could sort of be mitigated in that way. Thanks very much, uh, Phil. So what I've taken from your lecture is that I'm awesome and Cody's not, but Cody's your friend and I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> he did a terrific job.